Thank you very much, Mr. Latif. I hope it's working. Yeah, it's working now. For this invitation, I, I have to say I feel nearly at home because you refer to Davos and uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers is one of our uh, important strategic partners. Uh, but actually, speaking here, I remember when we had Davos in New York, and some of you may remember um, in uh, 2001, uh, we decided just eight weeks before Davos would have happened in Davos to move it as an act of solidarity here uh, to New York. I have to uh, disappoint you um, heavily because uh, when I left Geneva, it was snowing. So you cannot, you cannot keep me responsible for the, for the, for the sunshine. And um, uh, when, when you introduced me, I always in some way got the shock when you mentioned 71, because it's uh, such a long time ago and it, uh, reminds me of um, a, a discussion which I had um, with uh, Tony Blair who joined our foundation board and he was still in office in, um, in Downing Street and I visited him and of course um, he wanted to know everything about the forum. So I told him what we did, what we did already in the 70s, what we did in the 80s and so on. And suddenly he looked at me and said, actually there are only three people around who have been so active on the global scene since the early 70s. And then he said, Castro, <laughs> Gaddafi, and you. And I have to say, uh, I don't know whether I should say so with regrets or with, uh, with a certain joy, since four or five weeks, there are only two around <laughs> since, since Castro uh, left uh, his uh, official, official function. I'm, I want to describe to you to a certain extent what we are uh, doing and what, what roles the World Economic Forum is playing on the global scene and how we are positioning ourselves. And you may, many of you may remember in 2005, the National uh, Security Coun Intelligence Council published a report with scenario of 2020. And actually they had at that time, they described, it's a very interesting document, they described four different scenarii for 2020. The first scenario was a scenario of the American Pax Americana, it was called, which means, I don't have to describe it, that um, the world order would be still guaranteed by the uh, superpower of uh, the United States. The second scenario was the scenario of a permanent fight, a war between Islam and the West. It's a war of civilizations in some way. The third scenario was called the chaos scenario. And it described a world which was confronting so many different challenges at the same time, climate change, AIDS, and so on. And it wasn't capable to cope with those um, different challenges, and the situation gets worse and worse. And the fourth scenario, and of course I was very delighted when I read it, was called the Davos world. And the Davos world is a scenario where in this new multilateral power structure, actors, state actors, and non-state actors address together the challenges we are confronting. And I repeat, it's not only the, the, the state actors. 
It's also the, uh, the non-state actors, particularly business, civil society, and so on. And I was pleased to see this description because it expresses so much what the forum is about. We are a multi-stakeholder platform to address the issues on the global agenda. To do it through interaction, through dialogue, and through interaction. Now, if you look, we use so often the, the expression globalization, and um, Davos has become a kind of uh, symbol for, for globalization. But if we look at globalization, actually, we have to differentiate. And so there's now a lot of discussion also, can globalization be reversed? Now, let's try to, to, to look at different levels of, diff of globalization. Of course, when we talk about globalization, we think foremost about economic globalization economic interaction. And here there is the danger through mounting nationalism and so on, that to a certain extent we could uh, slow down the process of globalization which we have. Just look at the trade discussions in quite a number uh, of countries, particularly also in this country. But there's another type of globalization which people often forget about. Risks have become globalized. It's a globalization of challenges and risks. We at the World Economic Forum, we publish every year a report on global risks. And we define global risks as risks which, if they become reality, they affect all of humankind, and in order to mitigate those risks, it requires global cooperation. And we have defined 35 of such risks. If you are interested, you can go on our website and you can load down uh, this global risk report. And what is interesting, if I look back at the risk report which we published in, uh, we, we always try to highlight, we have those 35 risks, we monitor them, and we always try to, 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 to define three priorities for each year. So in 2006, we defined for 2007 the following priorities. The vulnerability of the financial system, and that was in autumn 2006 for 2007. The vulnerability of the uh, financial system. Second, the US housing market. And number three, oil prices. Now, for this year, in the report which we published um, in November 2007, we highlighted water shortage, food prices, particularly food prices, and energy, and energy security. Now I'm, I'm back to what the World Economic Forum is doing. We are trying to highlight challenges on the global agenda, and if possible, to, to, to be a catalyst for solutions. But the World Economic Forum is probably even more complex. And we are known, of course, when, when, when I ask someone, uh, what is the World Economic Forum? What do you know about it? People are capable to describe the World Economic Forum in five letters, Davos. But actually, it's much more than Davos. So let me. Let me, explain our let me explain to you our strategy. And it shows also the impact which we are having. And by the way, by the way if I stick with Davos, we, we have had more impact in the last years on the global media 
compared to the G8 meeting. But if we really try to look at the World Economy Forum, we have to look at six different dimensions. The first dimension is our capability to convene leaders. And it's not only Davos. Uh, you know we have uh, built um, practically in each region the foremost meeting for, for regional leaders to convene. Next week, uh, we will have a meeting in, in Mexico, um, looking particularly at Latin American challenges. We feel that the interrelationship between global, regional, and I should say also in industrial challenges is very important. And as a side remark, as a side remark, we have, uh, based on the hospitality which we found here in the city, we have created um, our center for global industries just around the corner in the 53rd, is it 53rd of? 54, 54 Street. And I have the great pleasure to, to uh, that we have the chairman of our center for global industries, uh, Jean-Pierre Rousseau. Uh, with us uh, this evening and Kevin Steinberg. Kevin, where are you? Um, who is our CEO of our operation here. And our commitment to this city is also shown that we had today a board meeting and in the board meeting we decided that we double office space so we will be soon about 80 um, colleagues located here. Uh, to serve particularly the New York uh, uh, constituency. But it's not a representative office. It's a center for all our global industry uh, activities. So the so first dimension is this convening capability. But convening people is not enough. So we, we created communities. We always speak about the Davos community. The Davos community is a assembly, if I may use this word, of people, of leaders, who are concerned with the state of the world, and who are ready and committed to do something about it, to improve the state of the world. So it's a community of purpose. It's a global community. And we have subdivided this community in 26 different um, smaller communities. So it's not only business. We have a community of um, political leaders. We have a community of trade union leaders. We have a community of NGOs. We have a community of young global leaders. Um, we have a community of um, social entrepreneurs. And I could go on and on. 26 different communities. So the forum is a community builder, a global community builder. So that's the second dimension. Now, if you build communities, there has to be, there's a general purpose, improving the state of the world, but there has to be some action. So what we are doing is to create mainly public-private partnerships. And we have today about 50 such different partnerships. Um, for example, we are running, uh, in most African countries, a public-private partnership to fight uh, malaria, AIDS, and tuberculosis at the workplace. So that's one of our many um, partnerships. So that's the third dimension. The so fourth dimension is that we feel the next generation, if you take the medium age in the world, it's 25 years. So we have to make efforts to integrate particularly the new generation. The world is changing so fast. There are new paradigms. And for this reason, we put special emphasis also on young global leaders, on the incoming generation of, of global companies. I was, uh, before coming here, I was in, um, at the Kennedy School, and we had 
70 of our young global leaders um, uh, participating in a leadership course. And uh, so, so participants, let's say, comprised uh, people from um, the Crown Prince of Norway uh, to the vice president of one of the smaller Latin American countries, uh, entrepre social entrepreneurs, uh, and so on and so on. And I was thinking when I came out of uh, this lecture, this discussion yesterday night, and I was walking back to my hotel, I was thinking, um, how would I characterize what I was so, so enthusiastic. And then I felt if I would have a theme, if I would be forced now to define a theme for the next annual meeting in Davos, based on my experience, then I would say from the age of cynicism to the age of idealism. That was my impression of, of, of uh, uh, this uh, young generation. So you have, I repeat, the convening power, the community building, the public-private partnerships, and um, special emphasis given to the future. Now, the fifth dimension, and those four dimensions, the first four, are very well accomplished. The fifth dimension is that we, at the moment, are um, looking, and not only looking, we are establishing a virtual platform of interaction, a kind of um, Facebook for global leaders. And we are working together in a consortium which actually comprises uh, Facebook, but which also comprises Adobe, Microsoft, AMD, to develop the most sophisticated interaction system for global leaders. With the objective to have Davos not only once in a year, but to have a virtual Davos across the whole year. The world is moving so fast, so whenever a situation occurs, you can put together the respective leaders. Now the last dimension, which we are also just now um, um, developing, uh, we, we have I, I spoke before about those 35 different risks which we have defined in our Global Risk Report. Now we have extended this and we have defined 100 uh, different global challenges. It ranges from water issues to competitive issues and so on. And we feel the world today, uh, one of the problems of the world today is that it is still very much compartmentalized. You have finance, you have environment, and so on and so on. But all those issues, just take what I said before, um, food security. It's interrelated to water, it's interrelated to climate change, it's interrelated to uh, nutrition habits, and so on and so on. So what we want to do, we want to create a, a mechanism which would allow the world to deal with the issues in an interdisciplinary way. So we have, we, we have created already quite a number, and the target is by year end to have 100 uh, global agenda councils. So let's take the water issue. What we do is to take the 20 most relevant and most knowledgeable people in the water domain uh, to join uh, this council. Or let's take um, competitiveness um, under the leadership, for example, of Michael Porter. We have assembled the 20 top uh, around the world. So it comprises Chinese, uh, uh, Indian, and so on, top specialists in the competitive area. So this network, this, um, uh, this foremost intelligence network for global issues um, will feed into our different activities and will determine to a certain extent 
what we are doing and will be the intellectual backbone of our virtual interaction system. Those are the, the uh, 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 six dimensions of the forum. Let me uh, conclude by just saying one word about our concept of corporate um, engagement into society. And uh, you may have read my, my article in um, Foreign Affairs in the January, February issue, where I um, uh, try to structure better how corporations should engage into global society. And I distinguish between five different uh, types of engagement. The first one is corporate global governance. Uh, that's compliance with ethical, legal rules, and I think we can take it uh, for a given uh, in, in today's world. The second one is corporate philanthropy. We all know it's giving money for a good uh, purpose. The third one is corporate social responsibility. And corporate social responsibility, I define not in this general sense, um, very vague sense. I, for me, corporate social responsibility is what you could also express with the triple bottom line responsibility, which means that the corporation in its relations with, um, not only with shareholders, but with um, um, its neighbors, its employees, and so on, uh, behaves in a, in, a, in a responsible way. This is the traditional concept. But today, there are two additional responsibilities, additional ways of how corporations should engage into society. The first one is social entrepreneurship. We speak about, a lot about social entrepreneurs, and Hilda and my wife and I, we have uh, created, apart from the Forum, a foundation for social entrepreneurship, and we support about 100 social entrepreneurs around uh, the world. So we are very much believers in, in, in social entrepreneurs. But also corporations should exercise social entrepreneurship, which means they should use their own uh, creativity and capability to to innovate, to create products which respond even better to social needs. I give you an example. I mean, there are many examples. Um, let's take the new car of Tata. That's certainly an act of social entrepreneurship of a company, using its creativity, its ingenuity, to create products or services which help mankind to solve social issues. So that's one new dimension. The other new dimension is corporate global citizenship. Companies have a license, particularly multinational companies, to operate in a global space. We have nobody who is really in charge of this global space. Governments are partially in, in charge of the global space, but there is a kind of void. Therefore, corporations, together with governments, have a responsibility to address the global challenges by engaging. Let's, let's take the water issue. One of our initiatives were um, the lead is taken um, by uh, Nestle, by Peter Prebeck from Nestle, and uh, by our friends from um, uh, Coca-Cola, uh, to, to define actions. Um, how water shortage, uh, which we can foresee in the future in a much more intense way, how uh, we can address this issue. That's an act of, of uh, corporate uh, global uh, citizenship. Um, I think uh, Pricewaterhouse is also, uh, together with us, involved in quite a number of um, such activities 
of uh, corporate uh, global uh, citizenship. So we are living in a new world, a new world which needs new approaches to how we manage our global interdependence. And I may add, with a, I started with a quote of uh, Tony Blair, so I may add also, I may st uh, finish with a quote of Tony Blair. Um, one sentence he said in, in, in Davos, um, this is here, which is obvious, of course it's something which is obvious, but it stuck into my mind. He said, the defining issue of the 21st century will be how we define the management of global interdependence. Thank you. Any comment, question? Dr. Schor, we did get a few questions in advance, so maybe I'll, I'll just run through one or two of them just to get the activity going here. But uh, one was a uh, discussion about. Uh, so we got a few questions in advance, Hassan. So uh, one of the comments was uh, around Africa. And if you take a look at India and China and the development economically within those countries, uh, where do you see Africa relative to the achievement that they've had in where the countries like India and China have had, and, and what's your view as to where Africa sits and where, where it's headed? As a general remark, I, I come back to this issue of food security, which the increase of food prices I think is a major challenge for the world and particularly for countries like Africa, but also India and uh, China. Just to, get, just to illustrate the, the dimension of the issue, um, if you take, and I, I have only um, approximately uh, the figures in my mind, if you take a European consumer's basket, I think you have around, depending on the country, you have around 15 to 20% which is allocated to food. If you take an Egyptian consumer basket, it's 50%. If you take a, a basket, a consumer basket in Kenya, it's 65%. So let's take Egypt. If you increase the food price by two, what has happened for many of uh, the commodities, you practically eat away the household budget and particularly of the poor families. So I see the big danger um, for, the, for, the, um, uh, for the coming years uh, yes, we made progress in, in Africa. The forum, I think, was one of the uh, catalysts for, um, uh, together with uh, Bono, um, to cancel um, uh, debts of the um, uh, least uh, developed countries. Um, yes, we make progress, but um, look at Egypt now. I see major social tensions. We speak about the gap between the rich and the poor, but by mounting food prices, this will be, um, how shall I say, accentuated in a way which could really lead uh, to, to so not only to social unrest, but to political um, revolts in quite of those countries. Now, India and, and um, China, we see in China already also, we see um, again, mainly with the food um, price increase, rising inflation. Uh, inflation, I don't know whether this is a specialist here, but uh, it, it's approaching now um, in some areas 10%. Uh, so the combined with the reduced in, um, export possibilities to the United States, um, the whole China 
philosophy is based on fast growth. And we have this slogan of harmonious society. But the harmonious society is only possible provided, provided um, uh, everybody in the boat um, is, is better off. And uh, uh, here, I, I think we are the crucial face in, 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 in those countries. Sorry for the long answer, but those are big countries. <laughs> they are big countries. Uh, you, you commented in your, in your uh, earlier part of your discussion that in 2006 you identified um, housing market, which certainly a number of us probably have felt the uh, pressure in the housing market in the U.S., as well as the financial sector. And we've had certainly what some would describe as uh, at least a partial meltdown in the financial sector in, around the world relative to uh, the credit crunch and, and uh, subprime lending. Um, and obviously, we, we see it starting to spread across Europe. J just your comments on kind of the status of the global economy, your perspective on uh, duration of uh, the difficulties that we face in the financial sector, and uh, what you see as some of the corrective uh, actions that may need to be taken. I just add, is, is this leading to a lot. Uh, <laughs> is, is this I'll sit down for this uh, one. Story on the UBS shareholders meeting, and there seemed to be some a, a current of anti-Americanism connected to the subprime mortgage crisis. I, uh, frankly, I mean, uh, coming from Switzerland, I I didn't feel any anti-Americanism. It was anti-UBSism. Um, which has uh, developed very much in Switzerland because this is a national icon. And people just cannot understand because if you, if you bring it into the context, um, uh, roughly uh, the, the loss is now, the, the loss which has been let's say, put on the table, and um, what is still uh, possible in the open, we speak here about 40 billion, uh, 40 billion Swiss francs or dollars, it's the same today. Um, um, but if you relate it, if you, if you relate this to the Swiss uh, national product, it's about 10%. Of course, it's, it's not only Swiss who are, who, who are uh, the losers, it's uh, internationally interwoven. But practically every Swiss uh, pension fund and so on is substantially affected. Is substantially affected. But I don't think, uh, I haven't heard, in, in no case I have heard, that uh, this cause, uh, let's say the blame was given to the US. The blame is clearly given to the management, uh, to the management of the UBS. Now, if I come back to the question, uh, we had, I, I spoke before that we, we create those global advisory um, or global agenda councils, and we had last week a global agenda council just on this, on these issues with the best financial economic experts and so on. And I would say the, the, um, the opinion was somewhere in between of what the IMF has um, published uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, and what I hear when I talk uh, to the people. Um, the people, our members, are much more upbeat compared to the IMF um, forecast. Uh, but uh, in this uh, Global Agenda Council, the opinion was that it will affect quite substantially the real economy because so much wealth has been, it's not only the subprime. If you take in addition uh, the increased oil price, the transfer of enormous capital to the oil producing countries, if you take the costs of the Iraq war, and if you put everything together, somewhere it must have an effect on the, on, on, the, on the real economy. And just to give you one figure, I was very, 
in Davos this year, we, we were very much involved and we had practically all the sovereign wealth funds um, present. And um, if, you, if you make some projections, um, the, the total capital of wealth funds at the moment is already, according to, to certain well-informed estimates, is already equal to the total amount managed by hedge funds, about two trillion, two trillion dollars. Um, if you take, if you take, in 2007, the total value worldwide of the equity markets, we speak about roughly uh, 60, 61 trillion dollars. Now, if you make a projection. And the projection is that in the year 2015, uh, the oil producing countries and the, the national wealth, wealth funds, the sovereign wealth funds, will have accumulated um, somewhere in between uh, 10 and 15 trillion dollars. Now, if you relate this amount to the equity markets, you see what enormous role the sovereign wealth funds will play in the global, on the global equity uh, scene. And with all the issues uh, which are related to it, I mean national uh, control, we have practically what we have, some people say, is a nationalization of, of the economy. But it's a nationalization, it's a globalization of nationalization. It's not your own government. It's a foreign government which takes the equity. Now, I, I don't want to be negative against, I mean, we have the case of Norway and we have very, very responsible um, actors in this field. But um, we, should, we should not underestimate what uh, over time this enormous transfer of, of capital means uh, for all of us, and particularly for the financial markets. My question has to do with, uh, it, it almost seems as though uh, uh, Davos is moving, if I may use the word, from a, from a platform conversation ideas to a more execution phase. And my question is, uh, do you think there's a possibility of conflict? I know President Clinton has a forum where he asks corporations to commit to achieve certain targets. The UN has a children fund that deals with malaria. A lot of these organizations rely on corporate dollars. And my question is, do you think that there's a conflict that you're heading into where, uh, the, the, with, the, with the funds and, and what you're trying to do? No, I, I welcome those initiatives. Um, and actually, uh, you know, um, I'm proud of it that um, uh, President Clinton in his book, he says he got the idea in Davos. But there is a difference. There is a difference. Um, uh, we put emphasis on what I said before, public-private partnerships which we accompany. So when we define a, a project like our global educational initiative, I, I just describe it in a, in, a, in a second, we have under the leadership of Cisco and many other companies practically all the big names, we, we try to revolutionize the educational system of uh, Jordan, Egypt, um, and now Burundi, um, by working together with the local uh, authorities. Um, we work also together with UNESCO, not only to equip the schools, but to put uh, to retrain the teachers, to put the new curriculum into, uh, curricula into place. So we work together with the, we accompany those uh, we, we do not, that's a, that's a difference to the Clinton Initiative, which mainly, um, um, and which is a good thing, which asks companies to pledge some money to make a commitment and some to come back and to report. Uh, we are, 
with the initiative or from the beginning uh, to the end. But there's one other, one other difference. Um, we, we feel, particularly with, say, a promulgation or proliferation of, of, of uh, such other, I mean, everybody is now somewhere active and so on, uh, has become very competitive. Um, we concentrate more and more on what we are really unique in, which is global thought leadership. So um, um, uh, let's let's um, let's look at uh, the future of um, the energy industry and its impact. I mean, just to take one 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 abstract example. Um, so it's more the thought leadership which we try to provide, and less the 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 concrete action. But we need the concrete action um, since um, people expect somewhere results. And I was asked uh, before, before um, during the, the drinks, how do you measure the success of the World Economic Forum? And of course, you can go on our website and uh, uh, there are all kinds of success stories we are very proud of. Uh, our impact which we had politically in, in uh, South Africa, in, in, in quite a number of places. But I think uh, for us, uh, people, people say, look, um, for example, at the CGI, the, the Clinton Initiative, you, you have clear measurements. Our situation is a little bit different. Um, you can, you can measure what we, uh, what we achieve as well as you can measure the impact of New York Times or Washington Post or whatever it is. Uh, we highlight certain global issues. We try to define the issue. We try to, to make proposals. We try to be a catalyst uh, for action. And we, we, we feel, we feel, so it's also a fine line, we do not take decisions. Uh, so people say, why don't you come out with a communique after Davos? Um, but we don't have, uh, we are an organization for the 21st century, which means we are a networked organization. I don't believe in those official um, papers which nobody reads at the end. And uh, I remember, I, I, uh, uh, no, I don't want to go into it. But um, uh, I, I think what is, what is very important, if you look at the complex world of the 21st century, nobody will be able to create a global government. That's out of question. Uh, we, have to, we have to reinforce the existing institutions. It's also clear, like NATO and so on. But I think the main impulse, the main drive will come from um, networks which are purpose-oriented and uh, which comprise the relevant actors and the best knowledgeable people. Shall we take one last question? Hello. Um, I have a question in terms of the 21st century that we're in. You mentioned earlier about the accumulation of great wealth, whether it be oil wealth or other wealth in other parts of the world. Well, given that you know, most of the world is not free, uh, most countries, I, I think there are only 90 countries in the world, according to Freedom House, that are democracies. Given what seems to be an accumulation of wealth, a redistribution of wealth, to societies that are not democratic and are not um, perhaps as um, uh, egalitarian as the West. Do you have any concerns about this or is your organization doing anything to work you know, in this area? I think uh, we, we are all aware that um, uh, based also on the discussion and the impulses which we gave in Davos this year, um, there are now attempts 
uh, the IMF is in the lead to develop um, better governance rules for sovereign, sovereign, sovereign wealth funds. So um, something is in the making um, to subject those um, funds uh, to, to rules which we would expect. And actually, actually um, you have some, some national reactions. For example, yesterday, the German government decided to, to create a body similar to apparently a body, I don't know the name, which exists in the United States. So every, every investment which um, is over a certain size uh, has to get approval from this uh, intergovernment um, uh, body, um, which, which to a certain extent is a, is again, we, we have a new kind of protectionism. Now, you said, what is the forum doing about it? We, we first, I think, we, we, we put the issue on the table. And I give you a, a very practical example. I'm, the forum just made a proposal to the um, uh, sovereign wealth funds. Why don't you create a kind of international investment fund where each of you contributes, uh, for example, $5 billion, and you have one international fund which would neutralize this issue of national ownership. And this fund, um, I, I, I described it in the following way, would work like, let's say, um, uh, the, the company uh, Berkshire has a way uh, to take long-term investments uh, into global companies and possibly into dis distressed global companies. So this is a a, a practical um, proposal where we acted as a catalyst for. On that note, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Schwab. Please join me in giving him a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.